Gandhi inspired us by adopting nonviolent resistance to change the world, and he brought independence to India. And he inspired Martin Luther King, who, by the way, told us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And those words inspired Maya Angelou, who, through her writing, her prose, her verses, she re-energized the civil rights movement. But it is not just about these thinkers and philosophers. It's also about the great people in sports who excel even with clear physical limitations. And Tarana Burke, who overcame her own traumatic experiences to advocate for women who have survived sexual violence. And what about the asylum seekers who left everything behind and risked their own lives for a new life, and not only for themselves, but also for their families? Or what about Stephen Hawking, who at the age of 21, he was diagnosed with this debilitating uh, Lou Gehrig disease that would eventually paralyze his body, but not his mind or soul. And eventually he solved some of the greatest questions in the universe. So these individuals have shaped the world today, and we have to wonder what do they have in common? And some of us would like to say, oh, they were diligent, and they had passion and conviction and drive and guts. With a mechanical sense, I think of them as heat pumps. They are able to pull out heat, even from the cold, to convert opportunities out of the adversities. And then others say, well, and we heard that a lot, resilience and determination and willpower and perseverance and patience. The old philosophers uh, used to talk about fortitude. That was in the, the Greeks. And fortitude was such a beautiful word. It was adopted by theologians, and in fact, it became a cardinal virtue. And then we say about tenacity, psychologists talk about hardiness. And nowadays, we talk about grit. What uh, Angela Duckworth says is that power in passion and perseverance. But we have to wonder what triggers it, and how does it happen, and to do that, let's explore some of the lives of the individuals, we, some of them we have already mentioned. So let's start. I'm getting ahead of myself. I just want to add one more thing before I jump into their lives. I want to say that individually they exhibit exceptional grit, but in so doing they were able to catalyze the collective grit in all of us. Today, we see examples of that in all these emergent movements around the world, some of them emerging in the U.S., but they are rapidly spreading around the world. Eh? Life, uh, Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement and the challenges of immigration and all forms of inequality. Let's now explore the lives of some of these great individuals, and we can find them in all sorts of life. Let's start, for example, with the sports. Eliud Kipchoge ran all his life. He went to school running every day, and he ran almost three kilometers each way. And at the age of 16, he met his neighbor, who had actually been an Olympic medalist. He became the inspiration and the trainer. And in so doing, he continued running, now making, beating the world records in the 5,000 meters and the 10,000 meters. However, he did not manage to qualify to represent Kenya for the Olympics. That was a huge blow. He had devoted his life to that. And so, thanks with the inspiration of his coach and his own guts, he began training for the marathon. And he won several half marathons, creating world records. And within three years, he won the Berlin Marathon. And eventually, he would win gold medal in Brazil, but that wasn't enough. And he went on to be the first person ever to run a marathon in less than two hours. The story of Maya Angelou is a more difficult one to tell. At three, she was abandoned by her parents. And in fact, at the age of three and her brother four, they were sent across the US by themselves 
to stay with grandma. In an area with lots of racial challenges, with microaggressions of the racial inequalities every day of her life. By eight, she went back to her mom and she was raped. And she stopped talking. She stopped talking, became a mute for several years of her life, five or six years. A family friend during that time introduced her to the great books, great authors, and in reading those, she found her soul and she regained her voice. At 16, she was a mother, and through a very tumultuous life, eventually she would hear Martin Luther King, and she was inspired by King's vision. She came back from Ghana to help Malcolm X with the civil rights movement, and soon afterwards, Malcolm X was assassinated. She regained her energies, and in so doing, she began contributing to Martin Luther King's momentum. Soon afterwards, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And in the deep of these very traveling and consecutive events, somebody said, Maya, you have great stories to tell. You should write a book. And so she did. And her first book, brought her incredible success. I know why the caged bird sings. And once again, as I said earlier, with her words, he re-energized the civil rights movement until the last days of her life. And for us, in academia, Alan Turing is clearly one of those geniuses who was a genius from early age, even though he didn't do very well at school, he did very well in math, but nothing poorly in everything else because his interests were very clear. Earlier on, in high school, at 13, he met what would become his intellectual match and soulmate, Colin. And they began solving some fascinating problems. Unfortunately, Colin passed at 18, and it was a big, depressing time for Alan Turing. In fact, he writes to Colin's mom and says, I promise. I will redouble my efforts to advance the topics that so fascinated us. And he did. He solved some of the greatest challenges in mathematics. He became the father of computer science. He broke the German enigma, and probably by so doing, he shortened the world war by probably a couple of years, saving millions of lives. At the age of 40, he was convicted of indecency and the consequences of that he couldn't cope with, and he took his own life a year later. So those wiggles that I've been sketching as we analyze the lives of these individuals try to capture the mood, the energy level, our emotional response to adversity, to negative events. And we see that we can go in different levels of collapse, this reflects our sensitivity. And then it is a matter of how fast we manage to recover. And some individuals, in that rebound, they can overshoot. They commit themselves to being better than they were. We also saw, if you were attentive, that I had put some green arrows. Those green arrows are the individuals who touched our lives. Kipchoge's coach, Picasso's inspiring muse, Maya Angelou, who spoke about the rainbows in our clouds, and for us in academia, those inspiring mentors that push us to go beyond. And of course, we are tempted to put an exponential recovery curve and make all the analysis, but let's just do it schematically to see how life is all about, because when we read the life of these great individuals, we, see, we just recover some few events, but out of our own lives, we know that we always have these events coming on and off in our lives. And so it is a matter of how often they come and how strong can we recover, how fast can we recover. If we do so, eventually we become stronger and stronger, the proof of our grit. However, sometimes they come too often, or we don't recover fast enough, or we overreact 
so to some of those events, and then it is very difficult to dig ourselves out of the hole. COVID was one of these experiments, a worldwide experiment. Earlier on in the COVID uh, uh, pandem pandemic, um, Gabby Abelskam and myself began collecting data from all over the world. We interviewed people from uh, Asia to America to Europe, even here in the, in the, on campus and in Saudi Arabia. And we noticed that there was about one quarter of the population, this is all among academics, graduate students and professors, about one quarter of the population managed to remain positive. In fact, a quarter of the population felt that this was an opportunity to grow even faster and better. And then we wondered, what do they have in common? And they had three key characteristics. One, they set themselves daily goals. Two, they remain focused on their personal and intellectual growth. Three, they made a commitment in the middle of the quarantines and the lockdowns that they were going to dig deeper into the concepts they were exploring. But this one, this little sketch, also gives you some idea of the political discourse that you hear when you read the news. Those who believe that individuals, it is all up to the individuals to, to, to bootstrap, to, to, to recover and be strong, and others who say some individuals are so continuously bombarded with negative feedback that it is our role in society to give them a hand to come out. So now let's begin converging to our lives as academicians, graduate students and faculty members. And I tried to remember my life as a graduate student, and there were plenty of negative spikes pushing down. The grade that didn't turn out to be as much as I expected, the re research report that my advisor necessarily ap didn't appreciate that much, a paper that got rejected, going through comprehensives, the final PhD defense. But I have to say that throughout that period, and here I'm just trying to sketch one year in our lives, throughout that period, there were amazing opportunities to meet incredible minds, those that have inspired me the rest of my life. Now, as a more senior academician, I'm still bombarded with negative events. And maybe you don't realize that, but uh, we submit many papers, and the likelihood is that we are going to get lots of nasty reviewers. Only a small percentage of proposals get funded worldwide. Our students are not necessarily that complementary when they evaluate the courses at the end of the semester. But throughout this period, we gain great strength, probably in the intimate isolation of working on our research. And that is what the blue segment tries to represent. Now the question is, does this grid really make a difference in the ultimate success of somebody in academia? And so we actually set ourselves to, to find, to see if we could evaluate this. We created the scales and we asked lots of people to evaluate individuals they knew very well in academic contexts. We asked them to tell us what is their intellectual capacity, their grit, their dedication, how successful have they been, and are they satisfied? We compile all this data, that becomes an inverse problem, and I'm not going to bore you with details, just to tell you that these are the results. If you make a little bit of a mix between intellectual capacity, grit, and dedication, you're going to very well predict the individual's success in the academic setting. And intellectual capacity does play a significant role, even though by the fact that you are here, on average, we are, ab we are above the 110, 115 in IQ. But still, there will be important differences that will determine your ultimate success. But what is, what is, what is more important is that you group grit and dedication together, they are very difficult to untangle, by the way, but if you bring them together, they call the shot. Our ability not to be put down by negative feedback, to recover, to commit ourselves to be even better, and the persistence, the dedication, what Kipchoge calls about 
persistence and patience that will make a difference. There, there are two data sets showing the same story, but let me now replot with different colors, exactly the same data set, but I just am distinguishing here those individuals with low grit and dedication, the red points, individuals who react very deeply to negative feedback and who have a low recovery time, compared to individuals with high grit and dedication, who are willing to wake up the following day to give it all their best, to be even better, and who are willing to dedicate themselves to make it happen. Clearly, those are determinants of success. But remember, we ask another question. Are those individuals satisfied? Quite difficult to assess as external, because we don't know the inner emotions of others. But nevertheless, so far the data shows that satisfaction, no correlation with intellectual capacity. Satisfaction, no correlation with grit, no correlation with education, no correlation with success. In closing, academic success does depend on how we react to negative feedback. We have to raise our threshold, not to sweat the, 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 the small stuff. We have to commit ourselves to wake up the following day after a paper got rejected and say, I'm going to rewrite and I'm going to send it to an even better journal. And I'm going to gain greater depth in that concept that I'm addressing. It also depends on the great individuals we have come across in our lives who have believed in us and who have stimulated us to be all we can be. The last part of the presentation showed us that it is not the smartest, not the greatest, nor the most successful that is satisfied. Apparently, satisfaction belongs to those who find and embrace their calling. Thank you.